in my life. I went to a Lutheran school from kindergarten through eighth grade, two years of high school, Lutheran high, Lutheran college, Lutheran graduate school, a lot of Lutheran things. In the grade school, we had fairly every year, pretty much, we would have school up through Monday, Thursday. Monday, Thursday was the last day of school. We'd have Good Friday off, of course. Everyone was at church for three hours back in those days because we had real Good Friday services from noon to three and then back in the afternoon again and evening. And the whole school had to be there even though it was a day off of school. But anyway, Monday, Thursday was the last real day of classes and we'd always have our spelling test. And so Monday, Thursday was always on the spelling test. Can you spell it correctly? And I remember for lots of years thinking, I don't have to study this one, it's easy. M-O-N-D-A-Y and then Thursday. And I'd get it wrong year after year. I thought, finally, I should probably actually study this word and see what it means. It's not Monday, Thursday. It's not confused that we think it's the beginning of the week and almost the end of the week and Christians are all mixed up. And actually, there's nothing in Scripture that has to do with Monday, Thursday. It wasn't as Jesus got up on that day and said, oh, today's Monday, Thursday. I should get ready for Passover. He was getting ready for Passover. Monday, Thursday is actually a tradition that grows out of the early church and actually came in to probably define existence during Holy Week in the Middle Ages when mond baskets were created and taken to the poor so that they would have food for Easter. So the mond baskets, people would bring food in on Monday, Thursday, the day that they would celebrate communion at church during Holy Week, the day that communion was instituted, Passover, it became a time when people actually brought food to church. It would then be assembled by people and taken out to the community. The mond baskets were care packages that were taken out to people. And in fact, the church that I worked at in Michigan before going to Hong Kong, that was still their tradition. There'd be tons of canned goods and boxed goods and stuff brought in on Monday, Thursday, and people would frantically be putting Easter baskets together for neighboring communities. We were close to Pontiac, Michigan, and Flint, Michigan, decimated by the auto industry's demise in those areas, and we would take food out to those areas just like the early church did. That had nothing to do with communion. It had everything to do with what Jesus did before the meal even began. Monday, Thursday is actually two big things going on in the life of a Christian. And if we focus on one without the other, we miss what Jesus is doing. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as you read the gospel, it is Passover. Jesus sends a couple of guys, a couple of his disciples to go and rent a room in, in a building in Jerusalem. And if you're ever on a tour in Jerusalem in the Holy Lands, they will take you to the room. Just go, sing a few songs with somebody else and go, this is cool. But I'm pretty sure the indirect lighting and the tile floor and the beautiful gold wasn't probably there a couple thousand years ago, but it's part of the tour now. But you can go to the area in the city where they probably celebrated Passover. Now, I'm not sure why the disciples didn't get their entire job done, but they forgot to hire the foot washer. Maybe they were saving a few dollars. Who knows? Maybe it slipped their mind. But anyway, they come and they gather for Passover meal, and Jesus says, oh, before we eat, stop, stop, stop. No one washed our feet. The disciples were like, ah, it's okay. We're good. Let's go. You know, they wanted to get to the food. It's good food. Jesus is like, no, we need to do this. I'm sure, all the disciples were kind of sitting around going, it's not me. I'm not washing Peter's feet. Have you seen his feet? <laughs> John's probably going, Jesus, I'm your best friend. Can I get out of this? Jesus steps up and says, you know what? I'm doing this. And he sits his disciples down. And he said, don't any of you think you are better than anybody else when it comes to how you serve others. Monday, Thursday begins with service. It begins with Jesus saying, I am the Lamb of God. I know where I'm going in the next day and a half. I know what's happening. But I am here to serve. I'm here to get on my knees and to wash the feet of you guys who didn't even get your act together to hire someone to do it. It's not a menial job. 
but it's a job of service. It's a job that requires you to get on your knees, to take off someone's sandals, and to get their feet ceremonially clean for an important meal. It begins with service. The disciples were embarrassed to have their rabbi, their leader, kneel down and one by one wash and dry off their feet. And Jesus wasn't selective in whose feet he washed because there's Judas in this group. Jesus knew exactly what was happening. He knew the plan was already underway. The money was paid. He could have very well said, I'm washing 11 feet and skipping over you. But he doesn't. In the midst of hours before his arrest, he looks at his betrayer, eyes and feet, and washes the feet of the man who betrayed him. Who has betrayed you so much that you say, I want no part of you. I want nothing more to do with you. I am done. It would be someone who sells you into the hands of people who are going to kill you. And yet Jesus goes right to him and says, I will wash your feet as well. I am here to serve. No matter how deeply you cut into my heart, my heart beats for you, dear Judas. Is that not a last invitation to say, I know what you've done, and you can be forgiven? And Judas doesn't take it that way. A last reaching out to say, you aren't too far gone. Who in your life on this Monday, Thursday, need you to reach out to say, you are not too far gone? Or maybe you need to hear Jesus say to you, you are not too far gone. I am here to wash your feet and more. Peter says, if you're going to wash my feet and if it's going to make me healthier, then wash my head and my hands. And Jesus is like, don't get overboard, Peter. Feet is enough. It's enough. Let Jesus serve you. That's how it begins. This is where Monday, Thursday begins with Jesus saying it's about serving others. But we can't do it on our own. We need to be fueled by something. And that's what leads to this, the Passover meal. Their feet are clean, their sandals are back on, Jesus gets back dressed again, and they begin the Passover celebration. One of the things that happens early on in the Passover, well, to begin with, there are four glasses of wine. We'll get to each of those in just a little bit. There is piece of matzah, unleavened bread. This is Manischewitz. It's super kosher. Getting the leaven out was an important part of the, the Jewish preparation, getting out sin, getting out those things that would grow and infect their lives. Early in the, the celebration, before the meal, there would be a whole piece of matzah which would be broken into thirds. Now, in Exodus, we don't see Moses instructed to get unleavened bread and break it into thirds. This tradition grows into the life of the Jewish community sometime in the first temple and Solomon's temple and sometime, certainly by the time Jesus is living, it is part of the tradition. Kind of like you have Easter and Christmas traditions that just grow out of something. It, we, it doesn't take away from what God did. did but it added meaning. And so here are some of the thoughts of why it was broken into, into three pieces. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs. I personally like that the best because here's what happens. Abraham's going to get eaten early on. Jacob's going to get eaten later on. Isaac gets broken in two. You know the story of Isaac. Abraham takes him because he's told to sacrifice him on an altar to break his body. God intervenes and says no and provides a lamb. It sets the stage for somebody else being broken in place of Isaac. Then what happens is part of this is wrapped up. Okay. Who in here is under 10 years old? Raise your hands. If you're under 10, 
legitimately under 10? Raise your hands. Okay, how about under 12? And we got one. Okay, so Andrew, you're going to be the guy. I need you to close your eyes. Okay, can you close your eyes? Okay, close your eyes. Nothing's going to hurt you yet. Close your eyes. Okay, you can open your eyes. I'll explain that later. Part of the afkomen, that part that is broken, is hidden. It now becomes, in, um, certainly around Second Temple time, around the time that Jesus lived, and certainly nowadays, it is used to kind of keep the kids engaged in what's going on, because it's a long meal. And so it's a way to keep them engaged, but it's also part theological as well. So a piece gets hidden. The, the, the patriarch of the family goes out of the room, goes somewhere, hides that off comb in that one piece, and then it's forgotten. And then the meal kind of begins. The first cup, the cup of, of blessing, the cup of creation, the cup of, of God as Father is, is consumed. We move on then to a second cup of wine. Cup of wine, then this one, a uh, cup of sorrows, cup of uh, e Egypt and captivity, a cup of slavery. Later on, third cup, third cup of redemption, the cup of, of the lamb's blood. And then the fourth cup, the Allel cup, the cup of blessing, the cup of praise. Between the third and fourth cups, you, get, you, you have all kinds of food going on, the meal, the, the roasted lamb, the bitter herbs, all kinds of good stuff. Now, just think about this. Jesus does this, and in the middle of this, he says, part of this bread is my body, part of this wine, one of these cups, I'll say later, is my blood. And then he goes on with the rest of the meal. And then after that, they go out to the Mount of Olives, and he goes to pray in the garden. We get down on these disciples pretty quickly that they fell asleep when Jesus was praying. One glass of wine, two glasses of wine, three glasses of wine, four glasses of wine, bread, lamb, vegetables. They were full. It's called food coma. And they're trying to stay awake. They're trying to stay focused. They're trying to pray. And their body's like, ah, oh, I'm just so full. That's us today, my friends. That's us as Jesus washes our feet and dies for us. As he feeds us on his body and blood, we go out into the world and go, oh, I have a pretty good life. I'm pretty full. I'm pretty content. I'm pretty blessed. I'm, I just have no more time to do anything else. My time, my talent, my treasure, all I can do is just sit back and go, oh, God, you're so good, and I'm so happy, and I'm asleep. Or do we stay and watch with Jesus? Do we watch through the difficult times? Do we step up when Jesus says, stay alert? No. We are Christians that are lulled into sleep, lulled into complacency because our lives are pretty good. As hard as your life may be, it's better than some you know. And we sit back and say, you know what, I just don't have the time or the talent or the treasure to give any more. This is Monday, Thursday, all over again, 2,000 years ago and tonight. Where do you know you could step up and take a mound for somebody else? Reach out a hand, share compassion, offer forgiveness, be there, and yet you're too busy. It's just too much work. It's just too difficult. Jesus says, watch with me in this hour. And he calls each of you to watch with him in this hour as we are called to serve and to give. And he knows we're kind of fat and happy Christians. And that's okay because he blesses us. But he doesn't allow it to become something that holds us back. He says, take your blessings and use them. Take your blessings and share them with the fuel of Jesus' body and with his blood. Jesus uses the third cup, the cup of redemption, when he consecrates and begins communion, when he institutes it. The cup that represented the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and the lintel. At some point, he had to go get that piece of, of matzah that was hidden, and leavened bread hidden. I don't know, maybe they didn't do it. It's a bunch of men. 
They might have just said, you know what, we're not going to get up. I like to think that John, probably the youngest disciple, was made to go and find this. Some 30-year-old and the rest of the disciples are saying, you're the youngest, John, you go find it. I don't want to get up and do this. Can you imagine Peter, big, burly fisherman Peter going, oh, John, do it. It could have been a great time of laughter, John going, this is ridiculous. I'm a grown man, and the disciples laughing and having fun and celebrating, and then Jesus says, this is my body, and breaks it. As they all are laughing and celebrating, and then, what just happened? In the midst of our lives, in the midst of our celebrations, and in the midst of our joy, Jesus comes and says, I am with you. I am with you in the good times. I am with you in the difficult times. How do we take Jesus, body and blood, out to the world? We consume his body. We consume his blood. His body and blood are in your hands. His body and blood are in your feet. His body and blood is in your mouth. Jesus is still here to wash feet using your hands, using your feet, using your mouth. Jesus still comes to those who need compassion and forgiveness, and we carry him forward. We consume him tonight, and we carry him out of here, his body, his blood, his hands, to wash feet every day. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, may that peace fuel us, fuel us, to serve others. Amen. We take time now to collect our tithes and offerings.